The skills we need to live and work are changing. But what does that mean for education? Over the next few weeks, we'll be talking to inspirational teachers in different countries who are taking the skills that made our modern world possible and reinventing them for a new generation. This is Old School, the skills that made us and how they're changing. Hi, everyone, and welcome to a very special live recording of Old School. My guest today is the winner of the 2016 Global Teacher Prize, who has won acclaim for her work with Indigenous communities in the Canadian Arctic. That work includes teaching and a life skills program that has helped young people to embrace traditional skills like kayaking. I am delighted to introduce Maggie McDonald. Maggie, hi, how are you? It is so nice to see you. Thank you guys for letting me join. Um, and I'm really excited about the topics we're going to explore today. So thanks again, Nicholas. Thanks so much. Before we, uh, before we get into it, um, I wanted to say that I, uh, you know, a long time ago, Maggie, we met and you very kindly gave me this <laughs> kayaking t-shirt, uh, which I've been, which I've been wearing invariably. And I've had people come up to me in the street and go, you know, yes, kayaking, what a great, you know, that's fantastic, that's so cool. And I'm like, oh no, this isn't, this isn't me. This is someone who's much cooler than me. So thank you for that. Send them to my LinkedIn. I will, yeah, I because I'll do some promotion. I wanted to start by talking about about kayaking and actually you've done so much in in the arctic with indigenous communities there's so much to unpack but one of the central focuses of your program with the young people there has been kayaking and why was that a focus why was that something that you choose to focus on yeah great question i'll try to see how i can can come at it um there's a few things i need to say that you know, my background would be in physical education or kinesiology. I'm really passionate about sport, recreation and movement um, and play. I think it's just also important for personal wellness in the field of education. And, and it's something that's just really important to me as a person. So I've always carried that passion with me wherever I've been. And when I first started teaching in the North, I was using a lot of physical activities to engage with the, the population there. But as well, I wanted to tap into and learn more about their own physical activity cultures, you know? So the Inuit in particular, such a chance I had to work with them because they have actually invented what we call the kayak, though in Inuktitut, their language, they would pronounce it as hayak more with a Q sort of sound. Um, and it's something that has gone global. I mean, we find the kayak at the Olympics. We find, I, I can be in Mexico, like doing level one kayak paddling. Like it's just literally all over the world. And it came from this really unique culture that in so many ways is geographically isolated, like way far up in the Arctic, whether it be Greenland or the Canadian Arctic. And as I was learning more about the Inuit and the Hayak culture, um, I also learned that due to the tragedies of colonization, which in Canada, particularly for the Inuit, we consider to be acts of genocide, um, that that culture of knowing the Hayak was really in many ways being threatened and it, the, the knowledge base, you know, had been chipped away at and become very fragile. And um, that, that kind of broke my heart to see that um, because for a lot of reasons. One, I know from working in the North that um, the more Inuit and indigenous youth particularly are connected to their culture, um, the more they build resilience and perseverance, which is incredibly important because they face horrific challenges, including a suicide crisis. So as teachers in the North or educators in the North or from the North, we really have a, an interest in trying to bring the culture into the classroom or the classroom to the culture. And so thanks to the Global Teacher Prize, it opened up 
you know, a window where I could further explore that. Um, so yeah, I have a bias, an own personal bias towards physical activity. The Inuit in particular have this tremendous cultural connection to the Hayek. Um, and for me, when I looked at it, I, I felt that one, it got kids moving and in touch with their bodies. Secondly, it placed them in nature because when you're in a hayak, you're probably not inside. <laughs> you're probably on a body of water and you're connecting to the sky, the water, the mountains, the tundra that's around you. And for in Inuit folks in particular, they're connecting with their culture. So you have these three overlays of like body, health, wellness, connection to nature, connection to culture. And I think when you can work in that zone on a project that you're really in a special kind of place where wonderful things are gonna come out of that, including suicide prevention, you know? Um, so yeah, that's what led me down the Hayek path. I hope that answers the question to some extent. No, very much so. And it's a really interesting point that it is this activity, which is the intersection of so many things of, you know, something that's gone global, but which is so deeply rooted in the north. I, I'm, you know, I, I, so much I want to ask you, but I, I'd like to stick with with Hayekin just for a second. Is there, I mean, not to get too too technical, but what was the difference in the pedagogy? Like you, you were teaching, I'm assuming, kayaking, but also this was an activity which I'm, you know, and forgive me, like if this is completely wrong, but I'm assuming it's been passed down, you know, in that community as well. How, you know, how are the teaching styles different? You know, were, were, you know, were these kids also learning from, you know, from their community about it? Or was it just kind of you and, and others coming in and teaching? Like, was there a difference in the culture of how this has been yeah. and passed down? Yeah. This is a salient question. I love this question. So to, to be quite blunt, another, I don't have any background, formal training in kayak. Um, I am not a level three kayak trainer or et cetera. So another reason I, I love to pick this project in particular was it forced me to be the guide on the side because nothing was gonna be coming directly from me. I was gonna be more facilitating this like educational experience. And so as I first went into it, um, I tried to research uh, and with my community as well, like who here locally can teach us? What's the background? Are there are there grandparents that can teach us, et cetera, et cetera. And there were definitely grandparents who had stories uh, about, you know, memories of being little kids and in the kayak, but they weren't um, physically able to, to sort of continue that practice. And they didn't feel at that, some of them were quite elderly, you know, like well into their eighties and facing some health issues, but they were passionate about it and had some really cool stories, which was motivating. Um, the north, the region where I worked is called Nunavik, and it actually consists of 14 coastal communities. Each community is isolated from another community. So you, you can, they can only be reached either by a flight, which might cost around $2,000, or if you know how to skidoo the tundra for like three days, you can get to it the next village. So in some ways, they're like silos of each other too. So you might find that one community actually does, has managed to maintain it to some extent. The community that I was in, I think in my decade there, I saw somebody paddling uh, twice, two times. That was it. It was a teenager in a modern built uh, high act. Um, so initially we did lean into what I would call the settler community. Um, and I found um, non-Inuit instructors, talk to them, explain the situation, if they were going to be open for it. And they were really excited because with, with the kayak and they thought it was going to be so fascinating to be able to share what they knew, you know, with a group of young people and young adults who had this ancestral connection to it. We talked a lot about sort of the sensitivity around that too, because there are, there, you need a lot of sensitivity in Canada these days between the race relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks, especially around a topic like this. And then as I got to, so initially they were doing some of the initial trainings and um, I can say there was sort of a lot of like pause and reflection in the evening we would come back, you know, the youth participants there would sort of reflect upon what they learned. They might start sharing 
um, uh, culture, language insights to these non-Indigenous instructors, giving them, you know, actually we call it this in our language, or my grandmother told me this story, or et cetera, et cetera. So it was a really cool way that we were like building bridges. And I, I really appreciate that. There's not enough of that that goes on in Canada. Um, and then as I got more connected to the kayak community, I also found um, some of the Inuit who are doing it. Uh, and now there's one in, there's a few in particular, um, but because they live in the Arctic, which literally stretches all across Canada, like east to west, and then over to Greenland, it's a huge geographical area. So for example, there's one incredible paddler that we've connected with, and his name is Noah, and um, he's Inuk, and he was taught in a mixture, I think, of self-taught as well as lessons learned from his father and grandfather. But he would live about an $8,000 flight away from our community. <laughs> so, so there's all sorts of like logistical complications in terms of does he have time to travel? Can we travel to him? What can this look like, et cetera? Um, but we've been able uh, to bring together actually some paddlers from Greenland and um, to do like to do uh, paddling sessions and training sessions together. And the biggest thing I've learned uh, about this, and maybe I'm diving into real specifics that only a nerd who likes kayaking would find interesting. But um, as I've been told by Inuit instructors, or and sometimes they might not even feel confident use that term instructor. They would just consider themselves a paddler, um, but they would say the first move that they would learn is like a roll. And a roll is when you're in the kayak and you literally like swing your hips till you turn over and you submerge yourself underneath the water and pop back up again. This is like one of the first skills they teach. Now in the settler world, in the Canadian white world of like canoe kayak instruction, they teach that skill usually around like year eight. <laughs> so it's just like really different, you know, but, but for the Inuit, they're like, you have to know this skill because we paddle in like frigid waters where there are very like slim margins of air. There are literally like you can, like these instructors I've met, they, pad they paddled with polar bears. I mean, this is like intense where if you're in Mexico paddling on vacation, you know, it's a really different sort of um, scene, let me say, lukewarm waters, palm trees and sunshine. So you don't really stress the rolling and how to keep yourself afloat. Um, they also learn how to paddle with like guns and protection on them, all sorts of things like this. I think, um, yeah, safety for the north and those conditions becomes really paramount. Um, they also have different types of paddling equipment. They have these beautiful uh, wooden handmade paddles that like float super well so that if you ever lose it, it's very easy to, to find again floating on the water. So um, yeah, there's definitely some, some differences. Um, in some ways, kayaking now is very recreational for, for folks, but for Inuit, um, it was quite purposeful. You know, it allowed them to travel to important places and allowed them to hunt. It was about livelihood as well too, not just recreation. So when you're learning from, from an Inuit instructor in a more traditional way, those themes also come through, you know? And they share beautiful like stories and, and, and you know, vocabulary uh, about the, the names of the parts of the Hayek and all those types of things. So yeah, maybe that gives you a glimpse into, into what it can look like. No, and it's, it's fascinating because you have, you know, as I said before, it has become such a global phenomenon. I mean, everyone sort of knows kayaking, but so few of us understand its sort of centrality in, in the Arctic and, and that sort of vocabulary and those, those teachings. And that sort of is a wider point I wanted to touch on, which is so many of these traditional skills uh, and this sort of sense of identity has been deliberately erased by by the Canadian authorities. I mean, they spent decades uh, trying to, I mean, may, maybe this is editorializing, but to sort of effectively wipe out Indigenous communities' sense of identity and culture, including through 
education, including through the, res the, uh, mm. the, the residential school system. So I wanted to ask what has been the impact of these policies on, you know, indigenous communities, traditional knowledge and skill. I mean, not yeah. just kayaking, but more generally. I mean, because these are- yeah, it's, you know, it's terrible. Yeah. It's, it's scary. It's horrific. And I don't think yet the broader Canadian public, I don't think many of those in decision-making powers in the government really have a strong idea of, of the legacies that, that Indigenous people have been left with. Um, in, a, in a sense, in Canada, we live between Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks almost in apartheid, like conditions where the Canadian government also created this reserve system where um, a lot of Indigenous people live on certain areas of land just for Indigenous people. I, I'm just the Canadian audience will understand me, but I'm just trying to make that clear to any like, global people who are, who are people who are listening from a global audience. The North in particular doesn't have uh, per se a reserve system, but it is just so isolated and there's been a lack of um, funding and infrastructure. I mean, it's so costly even for communities in the North to connect to each other, let alone communities in Canada and the South and the North to connect. And I think that geographical apartheid, the sort of cultural apartheid, you know, creates a lot of distance and it affects us from connecting and really understanding the depth of the wounds um, so many Indigenous people carry forward with them. I mean, in Canada, we, we truly, and, and I do give validation to my government, um, for using the term genocide. It took them a while to do that. But we now call it a genocide, what they've been through. And when you really just sit with that word, how powerful it is, you know, what that can unfold and look like, um, that legacy is still there. And so there's been so much um, culture that's been lost. There's been so much like internalized shame around people's culture as well too. Um, and that becomes very sensitive, you know, kind of work, working with things like that. The Inuit in particular are maybe, they're one of the strongest in Canada in terms of preserving their language. Many other groups have lost so much of their language that sometimes there's just a handful of, of Indigenous language speakers left in their community. And when you think about language, what language means to identity, to to culture, to who you are, to traditional worldviews, to alternative worldviews when we face so many issues, you know, across the globe, in particular climate change, the climate crisis, you know, how valuable it could be if we could be leaning more into Inuit worldviews on what the climate is and what the land is, you know, and, and what our connection is supposed to be. I think we need those worldviews more than ever right now. Um, but yeah, it is very complicated. It's, it's very sensitive as well. When you look at the demographics, most, ind most indigenous communities in Canada have a huge youth demographic. Um, and the elders, the grandparents or great grandparents who might still be kind of knowledge keepers are getting older, they're getting frailer. Um, COVID was a very big challenge for them too as well. And so, you know, many of them are passing on. So it's really a crucial and sensitive time that, you know, we need all hands on deck to, to really like preserve the language, these cultures, et cetera. And indigenous groups are doing a tremendous job. So let me credit that. But I don't, I don't in any way want to minimize the amount of work that they have ahead of them because it's, it's simply mountains and mountains of work. You won there the Global Student Prize uh sorry, the Global Teacher Prize a few years ago. And one of the things you did was to share your platform with your students. And you, you traveled all around the world and talked about, you know, Salowitz and, and you work with the community there, but you also brought many of your students with you when you could. Uh, what was that experience like for them? And actually, I, before you, you answer, I should say that I think the connectivity issues are part of the reason that we don't have some of your students and young people you work with here today is that it's it's just been so difficult to get a working internet connection and we'd like those voices with us and we're hoping when we will use this recording for a podcast later on to 
be able to interview them separately and to have their responses to these questions as well. But what, what was it like for them to leave these very, what I'm assuming are very isolated communities and to travel around the world? I mean, those were some of the most priceless, best memories of my time since winning this prize to be able to share that. I mean, I, I felt like some type of guilt, like, you know, um, as an outsider to win this award for working with this community, considering our, our histories in Canada, um, I wanted as much as possible for this platform to generate direct benefits for Inuit youth, my students or former students or institutions, uh, communities in general, adults, anybody who I could sort of stir the pot up and generate something, I really wanted to look into that. And so I, and as I was, as I was receiving invitations, which I was quite naive to, I didn't know I'd win the prize and get invitations from like Chile, Colombia, you know, Argentina, London, the UN, et cetera. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I, I want my students with me. I would approach those organizations, ask them to extend um, an invitation to my students or, or colleagues, and so many of them did warmly. And, and then we would also talk about how can we shape this visit um, so that it has an Indigenous content as well, and, and what can that look like? And we had just some of the most amazing trips that, that are like, I mean, there's this one trip when I went to, to uh, Chile and Argentina that, that to me was beyond a million dollars, you know? And, and, um, and I can think of my, my, this youth I work with, Felix, and I know you're going to talk to him in the future and how his life has been transformed through these platforms. And I have no doubt that what he's going to do and is, is uncountable, you know, type thing. But one time I was invited to Chile, Argentina uh, on this trip and I brought my students with me and colleagues with me. And I worked with the, the people inviting us to try to indigenize the trip. And they ensured us that we could, for example, um, connect with a Mapuche community in Chile. And it happened, it was just so serendipitous. It happened over, uh, I think it was like June 24th um, was part one of the days that we traveled, which if you're Canadian, it's like the solstice day. So in the North where you're at the top of the world, it's the day where like the sun never sets, right? It's 24 hours of sunlight. It's this beautiful like red crimson sky. People are like enjoying the land. They're up 24, 48 hours. They're hunting, they're fishing, they're, catching seal beluga, they're on the water, they're on the land. It's like a fantastic time. And so we traveled with Inuit at this time from the top of the world, literally down to like, you know, the tail of Chile to meet a Mapuche community who was doing a celebration on that day because of course they're also connected to the land as indigenous folks and connected to, you know, the skies. And, and in their world, it was like the shortest day of the year because of their location. And they invited us to this incredibly special ceremony that we were not allowed to take pictures or do anything like this and, and um, just participating. And they welcomed us. We were with young people. We had visited a school. We were with their grandparents. We were eating traditional food. They were trying to unpack the meaning behind the poetry, the songs, the dance they were doing. And my students were like getting overwhelmed because just being in a most beautiful way. I should say my students and my colleagues, I, I sometimes say students to get the story out quickly, but I mean both. They were just being overwhelmed with this sense of home, even though they were so far. And they're meeting these like elders and they can just sense, you know, a type of connection or familiarity. And they're like thinking of their own grandmothers and all of this. And then they're just lost in the moment. And it's so beautiful. And I'm going to pause for a second and, and, and say two days before my, the, the Inuit who traveled with me had a chance, a select visit with President uh, Bachelet, uh, who was the president at the time in Chile, who, ha who has a very unique story herself, a female president, uh, all that she's lived through and governed over. And she had recently come back, to, come back from Canada where she had met with our prime minister. And so she was talking about indigenous issues and talking in a way that sounded very much like what 
some like what you might hear if you were in Ottawa or talking to our politicians, which you know sounds like Canada's doing a really great thing sometimes. And my the youth I was there with were able to hear that and respond to her and give her a much more nuanced picture story of their lived reality and how their um, what their relationship is like with the government. And in particular, we talked a lot about the apology. The Canadian government has issued an apology several years ago. Um, and so they talked about that, what that meant, um, how the words were important, but action and reconciliation is still needed in so many ways. I was so proud of them. You know, they're from these small isolated communities and here they are holding court with like a world leader. You know, and the Canadian ambassador was with us. He was wonderful. He was with us at that meeting and he sat further away in the room. And he never interrupted us. He was so, so gracious. And he pulled me aside after and he's like, I've never gotten more than 20 minutes with her. You and your youth, we got a whole hour. What? She was taking selfies with us. They were exchanging like beaded earrings. It's all these beautiful moments. Two days later, we traveled to visit the Sapuche community on solstice, this special, special day. And one of the, the organizers pulls us aside in the middle of, of, of this round dance that we were involved in. And, and he discreetly brings out his phone because we're not supposed to be taking photos or anything, but he's like, I want to show you something. Look, look. And at that moment in the capital city, I think it's Santiago, if I remember everything correctly, the president who we had just met spent two hours, like spent over an hour with and took selfies with, she's on her phone, um, was issuing a national level apology to the Mapuche people. And for my students to like witness that, to, to, make, to, to make power tangible, to touch it, to feel it, to listen to it, to see it, to have voice in those situations, I mean, it was, yeah, it, it was a moment, the feelings they had, the feelings I had just watching, the feelings they had are almost indescribable, you know, in terms of knowing that they had just been with that woman, they had talked so intimately about what in the national level apology meant, what the next step should be, et cetera. Here they are in an indigenous community having, you know, a once in a lifetime memory. And then they get to, to know that parallel to this moment, this is happening politically, you know? That was beyond a million dollar moment that, that was created because of this platform, right? Like it's incredible. I've had um, another student, Felix, I know he's, I, he's, you're gonna love talking to him. He loves to talk and he's such a storyteller. I've been able to travel with him to Colombia. Again, he's been able to do, uh, when we went to Colombia, um, we actually, uh, we were hosted again by the Canadian ambassador and I asked him to, to, like, as I wanted to cultivate this trip um, to make it best for Felix, you know? Um, I'm kind of getting used to doing these keynotes, and that's fun for me, but I'm like, what can, what can Felix get out of this trip? So I talked to the staff, and I'm like, could he run a workshop at the, at the Canadian embassy in, in Colombia? And they're like, sure, let's bring it on. And so here he is, the only Inuk student at McGill, or one of two, one of Canada's most prestigious universities, just about to graduate in his final year, coming to this home stretch. He's an exemplary young, young person, speaks Inuktitut, English, French, and Spanish. Um, and he goes to Columbia and he delivers a phenomenal workshop to all the professional staff at the Canadian Embassy, you know, talking about Indigenous issues in Canada, educating even those Canadian staff who by all means should probably know this before taking on that professional role, right? But they may not have had that chance, as well as the local Colombians who also deal with uh, indigenous realities in their own country. You know, it was fascinating and Felix just felt such a rush, such a high, such pride, you know, sharing stories about his grandfather. We, we played it in you at games. Like we did so many wonderful things. And, and what a tremendous professional experience for him. And what a warm welcome we were given. And, and sometimes we say that when I traveled with them and, and uh, you know, the Canadian government official is listening right now. I don't know what the take of my comment, but 
we've been so warmly received almost internationally, more so than we're received nationally. And that means a lot to my students when they go and they're treated, like we have these phenomenal, almost like red carpet experiences. I don't mean that in terms of like the financial resources, but I mean, they're treated so well, you know? And so genuinely and with people who truly authentically want to connect. And it's so important for them. And sometimes um, when we're in Canada, due to the tensions and the race relations, et cetera, sometimes it's harder to even create you know, those types of experiences per se. Um, so yeah, it's just been phenomenal. Felix just finished up a fellowship, I believe if I'm pronouncing it right, it's the Tutti Fratelli Fellowship through the Vatican. He's also on, on the home stretch of another leadership fellowship uh, through the Pathy Foundation in Canada. Um, the amount of doors that have been opened to, to him through the connections to the Global Teacher Prize have been just phenomenal. Again maybe not in price tag of what these fellowships cost, but they're million dollar plus opportunities in terms of the social capital, in terms of bursting through that glass ceiling that when you grow up in a rural indigenous isolated community, just having access to this global network is really challenging. Sorry, you asked me too many questions and I give you long- No, I, 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 honestly, <laughs> I, could, I, could, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke. Uh, it's one of the reasons I was really excited about this conversation. I, I really, really enjoy hearing you unpack this and, and just on so many levels. And I'm really interested in your point that in some ways, it's easier to have an impact internationally than it is at the national level. I wanted to circle back to that, but actually we have a, a question from one of our participants, Hina from Big Change, and she has something, a really interesting point that touches on something that we were talking about earlier in the conversation. So she's asking, Hina's asking, what do you think creates a perceived hierarchy between the values of different knowledge systems? Like where does this come from and how can we address this within formal education? I mean, it's just all about the power dynamics. I mean, in so many ways, our education systems have been, I mean, I'm gonna say this, I, I'm currently in Tanzania, uh, where my husband is from. And, um, you know, it's undeniable here that the education system is probably a significant legacy of the British education system. You know, that was probably, uh, a version of that in the 1920s or 30s, which was full of certain values that British folks had at that point um, that has just slipped into Tanzanian culture. Been so present. And um, I think in so many parts of the world that we haven't fully reclaimed um, our education systems to make them so much more rooted in local knowledge um, like they should be. Um, I think it comes down to so much of power systems. I think Canada is still a colonial uh, power in so many ways. Indigenous communities have done amazing things. There is, um, in my province in particular, I can, I, I'll give an example. There is uh, the Indigenous group are called the Mi'kmaq. And they um, have fought hard to create their own, what I'll call school boards. And so they now run their own schools um, in their own communities. Children, I think specifically have the choice to either attend their school locally or they can attend a nearby school, which would be largely in like what I would call a settler community. And, um, they're working on it all the time, how to truly like indigenous their students. And so, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of time. I mean, reintroducing a language is a lot of work, you know? So this experiment that they've done over, I, maybe it's been over two decades now is phenomenal, but it keeps growing and growing as they gain more and more um, Mi'kmaq speakers now that, kids who are at the age of five, six, and seven are learning Mi'kmaq at school, that they're being taught by, by Mi'kmaq teachers. Um, it's phenomenal. And we really see a, a movement now in Canada, and I don't know, you know how to language this globally, 
but there's a real push from Indigenous communities for what we might call on the land learning or land-based learning, where we really want to get young people and, and connecting to, to the land and how all the lessons that can be unpacked from that, but even from my own experience in the North, how complicated it is to do those types of things when we inherit these education systems that, that have bells going every 45 minutes and you're supposed to switch class. And, and if you're on a seal hunt, um, you, you just can't expect the seal to come in that 45 minute window. <laughs> you know, there's this really big disconnect. Um, so it really takes, um, you know, and, and I can even argue the, the effect insurance systems have had on schools. I, I've had plenty of headaches with school administrators in Canada who preach, you know, a child-centered education system and, and preach cross-cultural sensitivity and supposedly are supporting, um, you know, this Indigenous worldview project that we're working on, yet... Uh, you know, when it comes to the fact that we'll be taking them on the land or on the water, all of a sudden there's very uh, mega multi-million dollar insurance policies and, you know, our trips get canceled or delayed or et cetera. And so there's a lot of like systemic racism still there that needs to be overturned and unpacked and looked at. And and the reason the world views are, are not be you know, why we're not changing these hegemonies, I think largely is because the world views that indigenous people have, they, they still have very little social, cultural and political power, you know? So changing that is very difficult. That was a great question. I probably didn't answer it like a PhD should, but those are some of the initial thoughts rumbling through my head. There is being great work done, but I mean, you know, arguably, is it being done in sort of a neoliberal lens or is it being done in a social radical lens? And it would be interesting, I, I hope, when we put this out as a podcast to get Felix's take on it as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because I, I think you'd be interested. And I mean, I'm interested also because the world has co-opted so much of Inuit culture, right? Like, kayaking is a global phenomenon. Like, And in mm -hmm. a sense, it is interesting that you have people going to indigenous peoples and going, well, lesson one is this. And they're saying, well, actually, you know, we created this and actually lesson one is you need to know how to roll around in icy water, you know? And, and so it is, you know, at a very practical level, even these kind of, you know, what we see in the West as a recreational activity is, is something completely different uh, in, mm -hmm. in the Arctic. I had, I had a final question around something we were talking about earlier which is you know you you've taken your your uh, your colleagues your students around the world and they've had an, an enormous impact and I, I hope they've gained some extraordinary experiences but then they've they've come home and you know many of them you know as well as managing some severe sort of social economic issues in their own communities want to kind of become leaders and to start nonprofits but they face fairly significant barriers to doing so. Is that something you're able to talk about, about some of the kind of administrative barriers that they face, about barriers to language and raising funds? Yeah, and this is super interesting just because we're, I'm in the process of it now. I am uh, supporting Felix, who I mentioned before, in uh, trying to create a nonprofit register it and whether it'll have charitable status or nonprofit status and we're discussing all of these things and strategy vision etc and i mean there's just all sorts of things you know that can come up i mean one again i can be a neoliberal or more socially radical and say you know does the the framework within canada that even allows for nonprofits to create to be created you know really want a strong indigenous nonprofit that might be arguing for uh, land to be reclaimed, like very political subjects and content. So I'll just leave that up there in a bubble to create. But let's say, let's look at the system for right now, Felix, um, you know, trying to register a nonprofit supposedly in a socially inclusive world. You know, well, to begin with, all the, all the paperwork has to be done in English or French, 
which is not an indigenous language to Canada. Um, and the level of, um, of literacy, I believe that you need for this type of paperwork to be an administrator at a nonprofit in Canada, for your accounting, for your report writing, for uh, you know, your liaisons and communications is really at the undergraduate or master's sort of level. A lot of it in written communication too. Yet if I look at the region of Nunavik, which has like 14,000 Inuit, I mean, I could probably count on a hand how many have a university degree, right? So you've just created, you know, with, with this focus on English or French and certain levels of, of expected literacy, which is almost in a sense performative, you know, um, an expectation that is really high in that context. And you haven't allowed for their lived experience a way for that to be demonstrated, you know, in, in setting that up and registering it or, or, or connecting. If I look at the landscape of the North again, we are largely in the digital divide, you know? Um, thankfully, Starlink is coming to some of the communities and I think it's gonna be quite fascinating as that story unfolds, but we're in the digital darkness, you know, I often was working up there and I couldn't even open up an attachment that would come through in an email, you know. Um, many communities don't even have banks at all, right? So where do you keep the money? Um, you can't access online banking because you don't have access to the internet yet. Um, to fly to southern cities to be able to access banks or internet, et cetera, costs thousands and thousands of dollars because the government has or maybe purposely underfunded in, in the transportation infrastructure, right? Um, if I look at the donor landscape in Canada and I look at the main you know, big families that are known for their philanthropic work, et cetera, um, none of them have a physical presence in the Arctic. None of them. Right. And I dope that many of them even have a dedicated staff or liaison um, dedicated to to connecting with Arctic communities um, and a travel budget to allow them, at least if they're not going to be physically present full time to like visit, you know, quarterly throughout the year. Um, and then on top of that, we always have to remember there's tremendous like apartheid. Uh, very tense race relations as well, tremendous amounts of issues around trust, you know, and you've created a system where an Inuk like Felix, you know, who's a critical thinker, who is aware of power dynamics from his own lived experience through studying at, at you know, postgraduate levels at McGill University and through these fellowships and et cetera. And, you know, in many ways, where he comes from a family lineage of 15,000 years in the Arctic and his land and culture and language has been taken from him. And you can look at this critically and say like, you're now asking him to basically beg the Canadian government to give him the money back so he can go and try to chip away at all these issues, you know, that the government had plenty of funds for when they were running the residential school system, you know? Um, Right? These are government funded projects. I mean, the Pope literally came to Canada to apologize. This is significant. You know, what happened? And so, yeah, in terms of power dynamics, in terms of people feeling um, comfortable in dealing with uh, government organizations, trust issues, depending who's in power, we have a, a liberal government, a conservative government, etc. what that looks like how that landscape changes, and also just the bandwidth and time Indigenous folks have when they're dealing with so many crises. And I think this also speaks to that question around worldview and education systems. Like so many folks I know who are Indigenous, who are in their communities, could do wonderful things, could do like stuff that would blow you away if they had as much free time as I do being a white middle-class person, largely, right? I witnessed all those suicides in the North and it pained me deeply to lose students, to lose young people, to lose friends, to lose adult peers, et cetera. But I wasn't losing family like they were, you know? And this is a tremendous um, 
burden on their time and their energy and their overall health and wellness, you know, to both, how do I say, plug all the leaking holes, to put band-aids on all the wounds, and then also try to address structural issues from a constant place of disadvantage in a system that marginalizes them and says, you've got to be an expert code switcher to even get into the system just so you can ask for money to solve some of the issues that the system created. That may not sound very hopeful, <laughs> but I am just trying to lay out, like these are real challenges that are there that folks are persevering through, but they're very real. No, and I think it speaks just to the systemic level of violence and discrimination the, these communities have experienced for so long. Um, but I think, you know, knowing you and, and hearing about your incredible students, it's clear that there is also so much hope and that there's such a groundswell of, of want from these communities for a better life. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I take heart from that as well and from those inspirational experiences you described a little earlier on where they can go around the world and move people and have an impact you know that their voices are really sorely needed actually in this sort of international community which is dominated by well people like us right like we need their voices now more than ever um i'm, I'm conscious of time and I, I've, I've got to wrap this up but maggie just enormous thanks for taking the time to to speak with us today um i've really really enjoyed the opportunity to speak with you about this and I, I encourage everyone who's listening or who is watching the show to go and check out Maggie's work online and uh, she'll be able to point you to other resources as well so huge thanks to you Maggie for your time today and thanks also to our per uh, our partner uh, the Learning Planet Alliance as well uh, for the opportunity and the platform but uh, on behalf of myself and the Barkey Foundation and everyone Huge thanks, and uh, uh, please do check out the episode with us up. Maggie, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I'm on LinkedIn, as is Felix. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Take care. See you again.